Welcome to part two of our lesson on atomic absorption spectrophotometry. In part one, we looked at some of the theoretical underpinnings of how an atomic absorption spectrophotometer works. Uh, today we're going to talk about the practical operation of the instrument itself. Now before we get started, we want to uh, outline some of the main objectives that we're going to try to address during this lesson. First, we're going to make sure that we look at some of the safety issues that are associated with using an atomic absorption spectrophotometer. Then we're going to look at demonstrating how to start the instrument up. And once the instrument's actually running, we're going to look at how to optimize some of the key parameters for atomic absorption and try to ensure the optimal operation of this instrument. Along the way, we're going to look at how we can troubleshoot some minor problems that may crop up uh, during the application of this instrument. Now, before we can even think about starting this instrument up, we do need to look at some important safety considerations. In the last lesson, we looked at the hood that was situated over top of the atomic absorption spectrometer. And we said that the presence of this hood is there to make sure that we can remove any metal vapors that are being produced by the instrument. Now we know that metal vapors can be very toxic if we inhale them, so the operation of this fume hood is, is very important. Now just the presence of the fume hood by itself is not sufficient to uh, ensure safety. What we need to do here is also make sure that the vent is open. Now if you look at the fume hood, you'll see that there is a little lever on the front of it. You need to make sure that that lever is in a vertical position and this will optimize, or sorry, this will maximize the amount of airflow that can go through that vent. Now it should also be noted that the ventilation system for the atomic absorption spectrometer is being shared by the ICP instrument that's a little bit to the left of this instrument. Under no circumstances should these two instruments be used simultaneously. So not only is it important that you make sure that the AA vent is open, but it's equally important that you ensure that the ICP vent is closed. Another very important safety consideration is to make sure that the waste container is not full. Furthermore, you need to make sure that the waste container has sufficient volume to accept all the waste that you are going to produce as a result of your experiment. When in doubt, it's best to just empty out the waste container. If the waste container does not have sufficient volume to accept all the waste from your experiment, make sure that you dump the waste that's in this container into a heavy metal waste container in the laboratory or in another container if noted by your instructor. Once we have ensured proper ventilation and proper waste removal, the next thing we need to do is to open up the gas lines uh, for the compressed air and acetylene that are going to be used by the atomic absorption spectrophotometer. On the top portion of the screen, you'll see a lever with a yellow handle that is uh, oriented perpendicular to the gas line. In order to turn on the compressed air, you need to take that handle and move the lever into a position that is vertical or uh, parallel with the gas line. You will also need to turn on the acetylene gas and this is uh, accomplished by turning the valve in a counterclockwise direction by about three or four full turns. All right, now that we have addressed the issues that are associated with the safety of the atomic absorption spectrophotometer, it's time for us to start up the instrument. Now before we do that, we need to make sure that our lamp is installed. The reason why we do this is because this particular model has a flaw, and that is that if you remove a lamp while it's applying power to that lamp, you run the risk of burning out the board, and that would kill the entire instrument. So in order to avoid that, we employ the protocol of making sure that the lamp is installed before you turn the instrument on. Now a corollary of this is that if you need to change lamps, you need to turn the instrument off. Again, this is a safety uh, precaution on our part to preserve the instrument. Now once the lamp is fully installed, you can press the power switch. The power switch is located on the front panel on the bottom left hand side. And once you push that power switch, 
you'll hear the uh, computer turn on after a short delay and you'll be able to watch it boot up on the screen and load the software. The first dialog box that's shown is the one where we get to select the technique. Uh, in this case, the flame technique is the default and that's the one that we want. So all we need to do is press the OK button. Once we've done that, the next thing we want to do is install our lamp. So we press the Install Lamps button. Now the next dialog box shows that the instrument recognizes the type of lamp that it is. And all we need to do is select On or Off. We select On by ensuring that there is a check in that box underneath On Off. Once we've done that, we can press the OK button. Now because this was a multi-element lamp, we need to select the element that we're going to use for our analysis. And the way we do that is by clicking on the text box to the right of the word element. Here a dialog box pops up with a list of all the different elements that this lamp is capable of analyzing. And for the sake of this particular experiment, we will be selecting copper. Once we have selected copper, we press the OK button. As a result, the text boxes are now populated with a set of parameters that are associated with copper. So you can see the element is copper, and we have a wavelength that's already been chosen and a slit width. Uh, the wavelength has been selected based upon uh, the most common wavelengths that are used for copper analysis and the ones that are the best. Uh, typically, you will be using the one that is the default. However, if you're using a different protocol that calls for a different wavelength, you simply click on the text box and select the wavelength that you want to use. Now, once all these parameters have been put into the instrument, the next thing you need to do is press the Setup Instrument button, as shown by the green arrow on the screen. Once you press the Setup button, you will, see, you will hear a lot of uh, buzzing and whirring going on inside the instrument as it goes through all of its self-checks and gets set up. Now's a good time to look at the lamp itself and if you look very carefully you can see that there is a, a pinkish glow coming from between the lamp and the body of the instrument itself. Now that's an indicator that the lamp is actually receiving power and it's producing light. The next thing we need to do is to optimize the lamp. And the way we do that is by physically manipulating the angle in which the lamp is installed inside the instrument. The way we do this is by adjusting the three knobs that are around the lamp as indicated by the three green arrows on the bottom of the screen. What we will do is look at the intensity of the light that's being produced by uh, examining the green bar that's at the top of the screen. As you can see, the intensity is now indicated as being about 88. And what we're going to do is we're going to optimize the angle of the lamp by adjusting those three knobs such that we reach a maximum intensity being produced. Once we have optimized the lamp itself, the next thing we need to do is turn on the flame. And the way we do that is by tapping on the flame tab at the very bottom of the screen. As you can see, there are several tabs, Lamp, Flame, Parameter, and Analyze. Flame is the one that we are interested in right now. And as you can see, there is a small checkbox on the bottom left-hand side that says Interlocks. And the Interlocks box is checked with the uh, color red. Interlocks are the safeties that are built into the instrument to ensure that accidents do not happen. So there are several interlocks located throughout the instrument that are constantly measuring different uh, variables. Uh, as you can see here, the list of interlocks, interlocks can be seen by clicking on the interlocks button. Here you can see that there's an air pressure interlock, an N2O pressure interlock, an acetylene pressure interlock, a nebulizer interlock, a burner head interlock, and a drain interlock. What we need to do now is to look at all of those interlocks that are uh, pertinent to our experiment. We do not need to worry about the N2O pressure because we're not using N2O. Uh, the air pressure we're not going to worry about right now, so the key things we need to look at here are the nebulizer interlock and the drain interlock. Now the nebulizer interlock consists of a small probe 
as you can see on the right side arrow, uh, with a little bit of duct tape around it, and that big plastic sort of ring that is around the nebulizer itself. And basically, what this interlock does is sense the position of the nebulizer itself, and if that nebulizer is in the proper orientation, that will send a signal to the instrument letting it know that everything is where it's supposed to be. Now, with this particular instrument, we have had issues with um, the interlock actually being able to sense the probe, or vice versa. Uh, for this reason, we've actually pulled the interlock up and out and closer to the nebulizer itself. The downside of this is that sometimes that, um, that interlock can fall off to the side because it's not secured properly just yet. Uh, so that's one of the first things you want to look for if you get a nebulizer error is the position of that particular interlock and whether or not it's making uh, close contact uh, with the part of the sensor that's attached to the nebulizer. The other interlock that is a common uh, error is the drain interlock. And if you remember in the previous video, I mentioned that the safety, I'm sorry, the waste container has its own set of safety um, interlocks built into it and this is what we're seeing right here. There are wires actually going down to the uh, waste carboy. Sometimes the, uh, the probe that is sensing the liquid coming through the waste container is going to be dried out and if that dries out then it's going to give a drain interlock error. The way we solve that problem is by simply pulling off the waste tube and squirting some water into the tube until the interlock goes or, sorry until the interlock error goes away. Now once we've done all of our modifications we simply click on the update button and you can see that we have fixed the nebulizer interlock and the drain interlock. Uh, we still have an issue with air pressure but that typically goes away on its own once we try to start the instrument. Now, once we pressed OK, you can see that the interlocks now have a checkbox. This indicates that all interlocks are clear. And now we're free to start up the flame. As you can see, the flame is in a very light blue color. Um, right now, we are passing just plain uh, DI water through the flame. Uh, so there should not be any color to this flame. Uh, you may notice, once you add your samples, that the color changes slightly and you start seeing some yellows. If it's not a consistent color, that's a sign of a problem. Um, so make sure you don't have any clogs in your system. Make sure you flush out the, uh, uh, the sample introduction system with maybe some water or some dilute nitric acid. The next thing we need to do is to adjust the position of the burner itself in the path of the, the uh, laser light, I'm sorry, in, in the path of the light source to make sure that um, the path length is going to be optimized and that the signal that's going, or the absorption is going to be optimized as well. We have three different control knobs that allow us to do that. Starting from the far left hand side, that far green arrow, there is a knob that can be turned from left to right and that adjusts the height of the burner on the front of the instrument, so on the green arrow that's in the middle, uh, there's another little knurled knob there and that adjusts the position of the burner from front to back. And then that last knob there will adjust the rotation of the burner itself. So what you're going to do is you're going to pass a, a solution of the metal of interest uh, through the instrument and look at the absorption on the screen. And while we're looking at the absorption on the screen, what we want to do is maximize that absorption and go through each one of these parameters one by one until we receive or until we obtain an optimal number. The important thing to remember here is to make sure that the burner height is not set so high that the burner itself is blocking the flame. This is going to give you a false strong absorption. Okay. So pay attention to that. Now before we start our analysis, there's a couple of other parameters that we can change um, under, underneath the parameters tab. 
We can change the integration time. That's the amount of time that the instrument collects data before it produces its average value. Uh, we can change the number of replicates. However, three is typically uh, sufficient for what we're doing in our laboratory. And we can also set the read delay. And the read delay is how much time the instrument allows between you pressing the start button and sampling starts within the instrument. A longer read delay will give more time for the new sample to flush out the old sample. However, a read delay that is um, extraordinarily long uh, will result in a lot of wasted material. Now you can see there's also a tab that allows us to change spectrometer and calibration parameters. Um, the calibration parameters we are not going to use in this class. Uh, this allows the instrument to compute your calibration curve on its own and then uh, give you the values of your data and compute it for you. Um, because we are still trying to learn how to use this instrument, how to produce data, uh, we are going to collect all of our data points as if they were sample da data points, even if they're calibration data points. The last thing we need to do is press the Analyze tab. And this takes us to our data collection screen. You can see that there are three buttons on the left hand side. We have Analyze Blank, Analyze Standard, and Analyze Sample. Now, we are not going to use Analyze Standard in this class. Okay, everything is going to be a sample. The first thing we need to do is to make sure we measure the blank. And we do this by putting the sipper straw into a blank solution, which is typically either uh, DI water or DI water with some nitric acid in it whatever would match the matrix of the uh, sample that we're testing. And we're going to press the Analyze Blank button. And what this will do is allow the instrument to understand or to know that this is our zero point. After that, we're going to put the sipper straw into our first calibration standard and press the Analyze Sample button. And this will give us absorption data. And then you're going to do the same thing for the next couple of calibration standards. So remember, when you're testing standards, we still want to make sure that we hit the Analyze Sample button. Now once we're finished with our standards, we can then go on to take our samples and analyze them as samples. Please note that the instrument at this point does not print, so you need to write down these values by hand or risk losing the data. This concludes our discussion on the operation of an atomic absorption spectrophotometer. I highly recommend that you take the time to go into the lab after reviewing these lessons um, multiple times and practice all the different activities that are described therein. Thank you.